Is it possible for the closest person to be a traitor? It can't be. It can't be. April looked out to the window, tears streaming down her cheeks. It had been six months since her mother had left her at the orphanage. April was seven years old, and she was childishly naive, waiting for her mum, who promised to pick her up in a couple of days. But time passed, and her mother didn't come. Maybe something happened to her. That's why she hasn't come. April looked for excuses. The girls who lived with April in the same room immediately said that her mum would not come back again, because this is an orphanage, and they don't bring children back after a couple of days. But April kept believing and waiting. She had been waiting until she left the walls of the orphanage, and now she had only one question. Why did her mother abandon her? She was a quiet, calm, and obedient girl. They had their own apartment. Mum worked and earned a decent living, and they always had enough of everything. So why? April really wanted to find her mother and ask her this question. But first, she resolved to get an education, find a good job, and only then come to her mother as a successful and educated person. She wanted to make her feel ashamed and hurt, just as it was painful for a little girl who was betrayed by the closest person. April graduated from high school with honours, and then enrolled in one of the best colleges in the city. She dreamed of becoming an interior designer, and made every effort to achieve this dream. After graduation, April was invited to work at one of the famous design bureaus, where she had previously completed two internships. Her life took an entirely different direction. April had only one close friend, Rick. They had met in the orphanage when April was 11 years old, and Rick was 13. He arrived at the orphanage at an age when it is most difficult to adjust to a new environment. One day, the older boys surrounded Rick, who kept to himself and didn't want to interact with anyone. April saw this scene and came to the aid of the unfamiliar boy. Why did the five of you attack one? What has he done to you? April declared threateningly and bravely. Now get out of here, you little minnows. The older boys immediately responded. But April wasn't afraid and calmly replied, Don't touch him, or I'll call Mr. Weller. The boys turned around and ran away. Mr. Weller was a physical instructor at the orphanage. He was strict and fair, and never allowed the younger children to be mistreated, and everyone knew it. April approached Rick and asked, Hi, did they hurt you? No, thank you, he replied, extending his hand to April. My name is Rick, and I'm April. Are you new here? Yes, just a week. My grandmother will take me away soon. Are you sure? April asked sceptically. She knew that adults' promises are not always kept. Yes, she went to the hospital, and that's why I was placed here. As soon as she's better, she'll take me back. It's good to be optimistic, the girl said. My mother promised to take me away, too, but I've been waiting for four years, and she hasn't come. Maybe something happened to her and she couldn't, Rick remarked in a mature and thoughtful manner. I don't know. It's better to think that way than to think she just abandoned me, April sighed. When I grow up, I will definitely find her and ask her. And I don't even remember my mum. She and my dad died in a car accident when I was two years old. My grandmother took me in. We don't have anyone else. That's sorrowful. I never had a dad either. My mum and I lived alone. Then Tom came along, and my mum spent all her time with him, but I didn't resent her. I would have agreed to anything just to live with her, at home. April had tears in her eyes. I can't stay here, it makes me sick. Let's stick together, Rick suddenly suggested. It'll be more fun with the two of us. Let's, April happily agreed. And from that day on, they were always together, except during class time and bedtime. Rick learned to protect both himself and his friend, because many envied their friendship and tried to cause problems. But the children defended their relationship, even though it was challenging at times. Rick fought with boys because of April, while April fought with girls. However, eventually, they were left alone. Rick's grandmother never came back for him, because she passed away in the hospital. The teenager had a very rough time dealing with this event, and if it weren't for April, 
it's unclear how he would have coped. After Rick's graduation from the orphanage, April left alone, and those two years without Rick were perhaps the most difficult. She didn't want to communicate with anyone and withdrew into herself, eagerly waiting for him to come and visit her. Rick was only allowed to visit April on weekends, so the girl lived from Saturday to Saturday. Then came the college. First job. All this time, Rick helped and supported his friend. On the day of her 25th birthday, April woke up in a good mood. It's a good thing today is a day off. I can sleep and not rush to get ready for dinner, April thought, as she lay on the bed. Yesterday, Rick invited her to a restaurant to celebrate this day, and she had plenty of time to get ready. Suddenly the phone rang. Good morning. An unfamiliar female voice said on the other end of the line. Hello, replied April calmly. She wasn't intimidated by unknown numbers, as she could receive calls from clients whenever she wanted. Aphrodite Cosmetic Salon congratulates you on your birthday and invites you for treatments. We are giving you a week subscription. During this period, you can enjoy the services of our salon free of charge, regardless of your chosen service. Wow, thank you so much. I didn't know you had such an option. April was very surprised. She had become a regular customer at this salon for two years, but hadn't heard about this offer. This option is available only to our VIP clients, which you are. We are waiting for you at any time convenient for you. Hey, that's a great gift. May I come in today? I need a manicure, a haircut, and even makeup. Yes, of course. What time would be convenient? Let's make it 2 p.m. Great. We'll see you at 2 p.m. Have a lovely day. What a gift. The day had started greatly, thought a happy April. And then came the congratulatory calls from colleagues. April couldn't even make it to the bathroom to wash up and take a shower, as the phone kept ringing. The final surprise came when the director called. I heartily congratulate you on your birthday. I wish you good health, boundless energy, creative successes, innovative solutions, and great happiness as a woman. Since you are one of the best employees in our office, the management has decided to reward you for your excellent work and, in honour of your birthday, award you a one-week trip to the sea. And, by the way, the voucher is for two people, the director said. Mr. Dottillo, thank you so much. I'm speechless. But my vacation is only in three months. Oh, come on, don't worry about it. I'll let you take a week off now. Have a pleasant day. April thanked the director once again and hung up. This is truly a celebration. I've never had a birthday like this before. April had already entered the bathroom when suddenly the doorbell rang. If there's any more surprise, I'll faint with happiness. She smiled, threw on her robe and went to open the door. On the threshold stood the delivery man with a huge bouquet of roses. April Peters, he asked politely. Yes, it's me. Flowers for you. Sign here, please. April signed, held out a leaf and took the bouquet. Twenty-five delicately creamy roses exuded a subtle, pleasant fragrance. A small card was visible in the centre of the bouquet. April pulled it out and read, April, my dear little girl, happy birthday to you. See you tonight. Well, of course, who else could send me flowers? Only Rick, smiling, said April. She put the roses in a vase and went to the bathroom. After taking a shower and drinking coffee, April decided to pick an outfit for the evening. She moved from one rack to another, but she didn't like any of them. In the orphanage, I only had two dresses and one skirt for the whole year, April smiled. It was easier to choose. So I must buy something interesting, since today is such an unusual birthday. April got dressed and went shopping. Then she visited the salon to get her manicure, hair and makeup done. It remained to change clothes, and she would be ready to go celebrate. She had agreed to meet Rick at the restaurant. April knew her childhood friend well, and realised that Rick was probably preparing a surprise for her, but April could not even imagine what it would be. 
At the entrance of the restaurant, April saw a black limousine. Hey, I wouldn't refuse to ride in one of those, April thought dreamily. She paid the cab driver and walked confidently into the restaurant. All the tables were lined with flowers. Under the ceiling of the restaurant were balloons of different colors. On all of them was written, Happy Birthday. April looked at this beauty with envy. Once in her childhood, she also dreamed of such a party. Oh, someone is very lucky today. Such a large-scale celebration organized. She didn't finish her thought because Rick, in a dark grey suit, with a huge bouquet in his hands, appeared from nowhere. My dear April, he began solemnly and loudly. Hush! Why so loud? April tried to calm her friend. I congratulate you on your birthday. Ignoring the remarks, Rick continued. I want to wish you a real woman's happiness, great love, prosperity, and the fulfillment of your most cherished wishes. I have already fulfilled one of them. It's all for you. He spread his hands apart, showing that the restaurant belonged to April today. I remember your childhood dream of balloons, and now it's come true. I'm sorry I couldn't do it before. I didn't have the financial opportunity, but now I can do a lot. Tears flowed down her cheeks. April could not control her emotions. Rick, did you do this for me? Choking on her tears, April asked. Of course for you. You are the most dear person to me on this earth. Thank you. This is the best gift ever. April hugged Rick and unexpectedly kissed his cheek. No, it's not a present yet. It's just a decoration for it. Let's sit down. The gift is coming a little later. One more present? April was surprised. I'm so immensely happy. The waiter came over and poured champagne into glasses. Here's to you, dear birthday girl. To you, my Rick, you're a true friend. They drank the champagne and sat at the table. Rick discreetly waved to someone at the side, and the waiter came up again. He had a medium-sized box in his hands, wrapped in a festive package with a bow. Rick took the box and held it out to April. This is your present. Open it now, please. April, eagerly like a child, began to unwrap the gift. The layer of paper was replaced by a new layer. The girl couldn't wait to get to the gift itself. At last, she saw the oblong box, in which usually chains or bracelets were given. She looked at Rick and smiled, then opened the box. Inside was a beautiful gold bracelet, and on it was a ring. April looked at Rick. She was going to ask him something, but Rick beat her to it. April, my darling, there is no one closer and dearer to me than you. You are the best woman in the world. I love you. Marry me. April was glad she was sitting down, otherwise she would have surely fallen from shock. Rick, do you really mean it? I mean it with all my heart. Do you agree? I do. Hooray! She said yes! Shouted Rick to the entire restaurant, and the staff immediately burst into applause. Rick lifted April in his arms and spun her around the room. April was filled with happiness. She had always loved Rick, but she used to think it was just sisterly love. However, as the years went by, she realized she was mistaken. She was afraid to confess her feelings because Rick didn't show the signs of romantic interest and she didn't want to ruin their friendship. Interestingly, Rick had the same thoughts. He believed April saw him only as a friend, and, afraid of losing even their friendship, he kept his feelings hidden, and now they were laughing together at their past indecision and foolishness, discussing how much time they had wasted. Rick sadly stated, We lost so much time. Yes, April smiled, and it was all because we needed to talk. Let's promise to never hide anything from each other again. Agreed. After dinner, as they left the restaurant, a black limousine pulled up to the entrance. Are we going to ride in that? April asked, surprised for the second time that day. Of course, Rick replied, putting his arm around April's waist and leading her to the car. They drove around the city for about an hour before arriving at April's place the night they had both secretly dreamed of for a long time 
awaited them. Three days later, the couple flew to the seaside. They spent the entire week walking and enjoying each other. It felt as if they had just met. The week flew by, and upon returning home, they immediately applied to getting married. Their wedding was scheduled for September the 20th, the day they first met at the orphanage. April felt truly happy, perhaps for the first time in her life. She prepared for this important event in her life. They had very few guests, some of April and Rick's colleagues, April's neighbour and her husband, and Mr. Weller, the only person from the orphanage with whom they had maintained a relationship. After the wedding, April moved in with Rick. Their married life was peaceful, without quarrels or scandals. April sometimes wondered if such happiness was even possible, because everything was just too good to be true. April and Rick had a dream of opening their own design bureau and working on projects from start to finish. So, finally, they took a risk and pursued their dream. Rick focused on calculations and house projects from foundation to roof, while April worked on interior design and project arrangements. The beginning was tough, with a lack of clients causing concern. However, the couple patiently waited for their breakthrough, and it came. They were approached by a well-known person who wanted their help in renovating and restoring his parents' summer house. The couple worked diligently, and within a week their project was approved. Suddenly, a thought struck Rick. Listen, April, we can bring our projects to life by ourselves. We need to find a construction team to collaborate with us and move forward. What do you think? What a great idea. Let's give it a try. Soon, Rick managed to find two teams of versatile builders who were ready for a long-term partnership. The business started to flourish as they developed and executed their own projects. In just five years, their office had transformed into a successful construction company, complete with its own team of architects and designers. The team was content and satisfied with their progress. However, April had been struggling with the heartbreaking realisation that she couldn't conceive a child. Rick tried to console her, especially since he believed that they should focus on developing their business before having a baby. April agreed with him, but deep down she longed for a baby to complete their family. April went through medical examinations to ensure that everything was all right with her. The doctor assured her that she was capable of having children and that she simply needed to be patient. April grew increasingly worried and urged Rick to undergo examinations as well. Rick, please, for my peace of mind, take the tests, she pleaded. April, it's all nonsense. We can have children, it's just not the right time, he responded. April felt hurt by his dismissive attitude. Is it difficult for you? It's not difficult for me. I just don't understand why you're making such a big deal out of it. The doctor has already told you that everything has its time. But all right, I'll see my doctor on Wednesday and get all the tests done. Rick finally agreed. April approached her husband and put her arm around his shoulders. Thank you. I really care about this. Okay, it's settled. Now tell me, where would you like to celebrate your birthday? Rick asked. I'm not sure, to be honest. I don't really feel like celebrating, April responded. Maybe we could just go somewhere for a couple of days and take a break. Change of scenery. I think I'm just tired, April explained. That's not surprising. We've been working hard lately, Rick agreed. I'm tired too, to be honest. Let's celebrate your birthday and then go to the mountains for a week. We've been wanting to go there for a long time. How does that sound? I'd love that, April immediately agreed. Although April's birthday was still a few days away, neither she nor Rick could have anticipated what would happen on the eve of the celebration. That evening, after the work, they were driving home, discussing their future trip and the places they wanted to visit. While Rick had been to the mountain before and knew about the local attractions a lot, April had only dreamed of experiencing the beauty 
of this magnificent region in their country. You can't imagine how beautiful it is there, Rick said. You will really like it, and you will certainly regret refusing so many times. I used to refuse because it was so much work, you know, and now we can afford this trip, both financially and time-wise. Oh, I can't wait for this trip. It's going to be very... He didn't finish. A bright light and a heavy thump interrupted his words. Rick didn't even realize what had happened. He opened his eyes. There were the hospital walls around him, and a man about forty-five years old with a plastered leg was lying on the next bed. Oh, where am I? Rick barely audibly said. Oh, you're finally awake, smiled the neighbor in the ward. We're in the hospital. And my wife? I don't know anything about your wife. Just don't be nervous. The doctor will tell you everything. The man reached out and pressed the staff call button. Within a minute, a nurse came into the room. Seeing that Rick had regained consciousness, she called the doctor. Hi, I'm Dr. Castillo. Do you remember your name? He asked loudly. Of course, my name's Rick. And please don't speak so loud like that. I have a terrible headache. Do you remember your last name? Doctor, I'm not an idiot. I remember, of course. Mitchell is my last name. Tell me, where's my wife? What happened to her? You were in a car accident. Your wife is in the next ward. She's alive, don't worry. Rick breathed a sigh of relief. However, he didn't like the doctor's look. She's alive, but what's wrong with her? Her injuries are more serious than yours. The impact was on her side. Could you be more specific? Don't worry about her. It'll just take a long time to heal. Well, thank God it's all right then. Take care of yourself first. I won't let you get up today, but tomorrow you can visit your wife. Wait, what's the date today? April the 20th. It's her birthday. Doctor, please, let me see her for a minute. The doctor lowered his eyes and turned away. Is something wrong? She is unconscious at the moment. There is no point in your visit, I'm sorry. No, there is, you don't understand. She needs me more than ever. She'll hear my voice and wake up. We've been together since the orphanage. We have no one else but each other. Please let me. Rick was almost crying with hopelessness. The heart of the nurse, who was standing next to the doctor, couldn't stand it. Dr. Castillo, can I take him in a wheelchair? I promise not more than five minutes. I'll supervise. What if she really does hear him and wakes up? All right, but only for five minutes, said the doctor sternly and walked out. Rick looked gratefully at the nurse. Thank you so much for your support. You're welcome. Your spouse is lucky to have such a husband. Not everyone would be so concerned and supportive. Believe me, I know what I'm talking about. I've seen a lot of it in my years here. I love her very much. I can see that, the nurse smiled. You rest for now. I'll be back in half an hour to pick you up. Rick looked at his neighbor and then out the window and thought, It's ironic. My parents died in an accident, and I had an accident. But at least I survived, and the main thing is, April is alive too. When the nurse came in, Rick was already sitting on the edge of the bed. How quick you are, she marveled. And by the way, you have a concussion. Not a bad one, but you have one. And a knee injury, so please take care of yourself. Your wife needs you. It was only after these words that Rick turned his attention to his leg. It was bandaged. Probably they've given me a lot of anaesthetics, since I do not feel it at all, he thought, and he got into the wheelchair. April's ward was one door away from his. The nurse opened the doors and took the wheelchair into the room. There was no one in there except April. They wheeled closer, and Rick could see his spouse. There was a huge hematoma on her cheek and shoulder, her arm in a cast, tubes sticking out of her mouth. The sight was terrible, especially when you're looking at a loved one. Sarah, please tell me the truth. What's wrong with her? Rick asked, reading the nurse's name on her name tags. 
What you're seeing is nothing. It'll heal in a couple of weeks. Your wife has a spinal injury. Currently, the doctors are deciding what to do. And most importantly, she needs to get her consciousness. That's the most important thing now. This made Rick feel bad. What do you mean, a spinal injury? Why didn't the doctor say anything about it? And what does it all mean? Is April disabled now? Can she be helped, or will she be disabled now? Rick asked hopefully, but he did not hear what he desired to hear. No one can answer that question for you yet. She's having a repeat MRI today. Our chief neurosurgeon is coming, and he will make a final diagnosis and deal with your wife's treatment. But she's probably going to need some spinal surgery. I can tell you that. She paused for a moment and continued, that you'll have to be patient. It's going to take a long time for her to recover. I understand. Thank you for being honest. The important thing is that she's alive, and we can handle the rest. God willing, Sarah said quietly. I'll leave you for five minutes, then I'll take you back. No moving around without me. Okay, thank you again. Sarah went out, and Rick remained sitting in the chair near April and tried to understand what to do now and what will happen next. He took his spouse's hand and started talking to her. April, my dear, happy birthday. Today is such a day. You must wake up, you must. I love you very much. I can't live without you. You know that very well. We'll get through this. Just wake up and tell me you love me. Everything else will be all right. He stopped talking and looked up. I hope so. Suddenly it seemed to him that April had squeezed his fingers. It was at that moment that Sarah walked in. Sarah, she squeezed my hand, Rick said excitedly. Are you sure? The nurse was surprised. You might have imagined it because you want it so badly. At that moment, they both heard a quiet sound that April made. Sarah quickly rushed out of the room. A minute later, there were already three doctors and two nurses in the room. Rick was taken back to his ward and asked to wait patiently. It was the longest half hour of his life. It seemed to Rick that his heart was beating so loudly that he could hear it even in the corridor. Finally, Dr. Castillo came in. You were right, your presence has worked, and April came to her senses. But I'll tell you frankly, it's a very difficult situation. Rick tried to cope with the excitement to ask the main question. Doctor, tell me honestly, will she walk? I don't know that, to be honest. Let's wait for the results of all the tests, and then I'll tell you what to prepare for. The doctor answered and looked at Rick carefully. And now you answer honestly. Are you willing to fight for her and with her? This is a very important point. I love my wife, and I will be with her, whatever verdict you give, Rick said confidently. I believe you. Your spouse is lucky. Dr. Castillo patted Rick on the shoulder. Hang in there. It won't be easy. The doctor went out, and Rick was left alone with his thoughts. Difficulties had never frightened him, but now he was afraid of losing the nearest and dearest person. This fear stiffened his whole body. It rolled on and on. At one point it even seemed to Rick that he was suffocating. I have to pull myself together. Cannot have April see me in such a state. I need to show her that I believe in her. I believe that she will cope and I will always be there for her. I should wait for the neurosurgeon's report first. Maybe it's not as scary as they say. But the reality was scarier than Rick's fantasies. In the evening, Sarah came into the room. The expression on her face was very tense. She stood near the door and looked at Rick. Speak, for God's sake, don't be silent. It's worse than that, he begged. I have some bad news. Your wife has paralysis of the lower limbs. The spinal cord is affected, pinched nerve endings in six places. She'll need a very complicated operation, but no one will give you any guarantees. She stopped talking and lowered her head. There is an extremely high probability that your spouse will never walk again. I'm sorry. 
If he had been hit on the head with something heavy, the effect would have been less than what he had heard. Tears flowed from Rick's eyes. He didn't even expect them. The last time he cried was at the orphanage, where he once again fought over April. But now it was so painful that he simply could not help but cry. The next day he was allowed to visit April. He gathered his thoughts to somehow cheer up his wife, but nothing worked. April always read Rick's mood through his eyes and facial expressions. The nurse brought Rick to April's room and left them alone. The woman looked at her husband with eyes full of tears. She already knew everything. Hi, April. He started the words and stammered. Hi, April said very quietly and turned away. Rick drove up to the bed and took his spouse's hand. Honey, we're together. We'll definitely manage. He tried to cheer up his wife, but he himself did not really believe in his words. Do you really think it can be fixed? April questioned and looked at her husband intently. Of course, almost confidently, answered Rick. You know, once long ago, I heard such a sarcastic joke. If a person wants to live, medicine is powerless. You want to live, don't you? You're not going to leave me, are you? April smiled sadly and turned aside again. You know, she said somewhere to the ceiling, it would be right for you to divorce me. I don't want to torture you. I don't want you to see how bad I feel. I don't want anything at all. April, you're talking outright nonsense. I'm not going to divorce you. It's out of the question. That's the first thing. Second, we have enough money to make your life comfortable, even if you... Rick hesitated, not knowing how much April is informed about her condition and prospects. If you have to be in a wheelchair for a while... For a while... April suddenly got angry. Rick, I'll be in this wheelchair for the rest of my life. And don't pretend you weren't told that. You know very well that I hate being pitied. I don't need your pity or sympathy. I need your love. But you can't fully love a cripple. And don't try to convince me otherwise. Rick took offence to her words. So you mean to say that if I were in your place, you would leave me and divorce me? April turned and looked at her husband. Of course not. Then why do you think I'm such a jerk? The woman thought for a moment. Rick got angry too. Who told you that nonsense? Do you mean that men can't really love and all of us are traitors? That's not what I meant to say. It's just that men have certain needs and they rarely stay faithful to one woman for long periods of time. Don't speak for all men. Yes, it's understandable that things won't be the same as before. So what? We'll try to deal with it. What about the baby? The surrogacy? We can adopt. It's a workable situation too. So you're ready to be with me, despite my problems? Tears flowed from April's eyes. Of course, silly. I don't understand how you could think that I would betray you. And remember, together we can do everything. A week later... April had her first surgery. The results were not as the doctors had planned. It was decided to do a second surgery in two weeks, and then another one. During the year, April underwent six surgeries. The result was that she had regained sensation in her legs. She could even move them a little, but there was no full recovery and no prognosis for it either. During her last checkup with a neurosurgeon, April was diagnosed with a tumour on her spine. So that was the last straw for her. I don't want any more surgeries. I've been living in hospitals for over a year. I'm fed up. I want to go home. But we need to examine and understand. Some kind of tumour, the doctor objected. Do you hear me? I don't want anything more. I want to go home. Apparently God has decided... It's time for me to go to him, so I have one problem after another. That's the way it has to be. That's it. This conversation is over, summarised April. 
She called Rick after the conversation with her doctor and asked him to take her home. While April was in the hospital, Rick had bought a new house and equipped it to make his wife as comfortable as possible. April knew nothing about it because it was a surprise for her. Therefore, when they drove in a different direction, the woman was very surprised. "Honey, where are we going?" "Home, of course." "Is it just me, or are you going the wrong way?" "April, do you have any patience at all?" smiled Rick. "I never had it, you know that." April smiled back. Over the course of this year, she had calmed down a bit and gotten used to her new condition. She had almost become the same old April, except she couldn't walk. They stopped at the gate, which began to open automatically. April looked at her spouse in surprise, but said nothing. The car drove into the yard. It was large, with a lawn and a small garden. In the distance, a swimming pool could be seen. Not far from it, a gazebo. The house itself was one story, but large. Rick helped his wife out of the car, put her in a wheelchair, and took her on a tour of their new residence. Look. Here we have a big living room. Here is the kitchen. Here is the toilet, and next to it the bathroom. Rick said, "This is our bedroom, next to the guest bedroom." What's that door? April pointed to the side. That's your office. I thought you might want to continue your work. You'll be comfortable in it. Thank you so much. Yes, I definitely want to work. April answered with a smile. They left the office. By the way. Don't get angry and nervous," Rick said. "I've hired an au pair. You will be busy with work, and like any working person, you'll get tired. That's why I've decided we're going to have an au pair on a regular basis. Okay, but I would like to choose her for myself. In principle, you can, but I've already found a woman. Talk to her first, okay? Okay." Reluctantly agreed, April. How old is she? Fifty-two. Laughed Rick. Are you jealous? You know, better safe than sorry. Snorted April. April did not know that Rick chose not just an au pair. He found a woman with a medical degree who has experience in caring for the disabled, and strictly forbade her to mention it in front of April. Life began to flow in a new way. Rick went to the office every day, and April worked at home. Barbara, the au pair, took over all the household chores. April liked Barbara; she was simple, kind, and very pleasant to talk to. Sometimes they could spend hours just chatting in the living room over cups of tea. April told Barbara about her life, starting from the time she had been in the orphanage. Have you ever wanted to find her and ask why she did that? Barbara asked, "Oh, I wanted to, but then I changed my mind abruptly. What would I tell her? That she's a traitor, and that she shouldn't have done that with me? What's the point? My life isn't going to rewind or change." I understand your point. I probably wouldn't want to see her either. Let the deed be on her conscience. You know, April, I'm not a very religious person, but I believe that everyone will get what they deserve. Six months passed after April returned home. One morning, she woke up and felt very sick. April called Barbara. "Why don't we call a doctor?" Barbara suggested. "What's the point? They've already done all they can do." April, I'm sorry, but you were wrong not to have your tumor examined. Maybe it's benign, and you could have just had it removed. Barbara, I'm tired of these surgeries, procedures, and rehab. I want to live at home for however long I have left. I understand," Barbara said sadly, having seen doomed people more than once in her life. After a week, April's arms began to weaken, and eventually her legs stopped obeying her. April became despondent, spending the entire day in her room, refusing to eat, and completely stopping her work. Rick couldn't bear to witness his wife's torment. And started to delay at work more often. Barbara looked at the young woman with pain, realizing that she needed to fight for herself. But any attempts to talk to April proved futile. One day, while returning from shopping, Barbara noticed a man in his sixties near the gate. 
he was trying to peek over the fence, making Barbara wary. This was an elite village, and strangers didn't walk around here. She looked at the man sternly and asked, "'What do you need?' "'Excuse me, do you live here?' the man inquired. "'I work here. Who are you looking for?' Barbara responded. "'I'm looking for April Peters. Does she live here?' Barbara was surprised. She knew that was April's maiden name. Yes, she lives here. Why do you want to see her? Excuse me, have you been working for them for a long time? Could we talk? It won't take long, and I have no bad intentions. Barbara scrutinized the man from head to toe. He appeared intelligent, and seemed unlikely to be a swindler. Intuitively, Barbara decided she could listen to him without any risks. All right. Let's go inside. The mistress is ill, and she is relaxing now, so she won't come out. Didn't you know about this? No. They walked into the kitchen. The man patiently waited as Barbara put away the groceries, maintaining silence. Would you like some coffee? Yeah, I'd love some. Barbara brewed coffee for both of them and sat across from the man. Well, what's so important and urgent that you want to tell me? By the way, what's your name? My name is Elliot. Nice to meet you, Elliot. So, why do you want our April? She doesn't have time for guests right now. To be frank, I'm her father. The guest revealed honestly and directly. Barbara nearly dropped her coffee cup from her hands. Father? And where were you, father, when your daughter was in the orphanage? When she was suffering so much and needed a family? Where? Wait, wait, don't attack me. I only found out about her existence two months ago. How is that possible? I'll tell you everything, if you're patient, and then you can decide if it's my fault or not. Okay, just keep your voice down, please. I used to date April's mother years ago. I loved her deeply, but she chose another man. I didn't have the money she wanted, so she turned me down. I was devastated and decided to leave town to forget her as soon as possible. By chance, I ended up abroad, earned money, and returned to the country, but not to my hometown. Instead, I settled in the capital and got a job at a clinic. I didn't mention that I was a doctor, specialising in rehabilitation. With my extensive experience, especially from Europe, they hired me without question. Then two months ago, I received a call from my sister, who stayed in our hometown, informing me that Helen Peters, April's mother, was looking for me. I was very surprised, as we hadn't spoken since the day she drove me away. My sister tearfully asked me to get in touch with her. I took a vacation and went to see her. The man suddenly changed his expression, looking away from the window to hide the tears in his eyes before continuing. She had cancer, she was dying, and she told me about our daughter. I was in shock, to be honest. But when she told me what she had done to our daughter, I was ready to punch her. I asked her, Why didn't you find me earlier and give the girl to me if you didn't want her? And what did she say? Barbara asked her question. She said she didn't even think about it. But dying, she decided to repent to me. She told me which orphanage she brought April to and asked me to find her and tell her that she regretted her action and apologised for her broken life. The man paused again, though I honestly don't know how such a thing can be forgiven. It's a sad story, Barbara agreed. What are you going to do now? Tell April the truth? Of course, that's why I was looking for her. I have no guilt towards my daughter. I knew nothing of her existence. I think she is an adult and will realise this. Do you think she will be glad to see me? I don't know. Honestly, she doesn't want to see anyone at all right now. Barbara told Elliot everything she knew about what had happened. The man's face changed its expression a couple of times, and after the whole story he asked, May I see her? Elliot, I think April needs to be prepared somehow. At that moment a call came from April's room. Barbara! Call a doctor, I don't feel well at all. And then Barbara decided to take advantage of the situation 
You know, I broke our agreement about not involving myself in your health. I'm sorry, but my brother is here now, and he's a rehab doctor. Might he call? Might he see you first? I don't care. Call him. Barbara ran out and called Elliot, warning him not to introduce himself as her brother. Why? April's father didn't understand. Listen, if you want to help your daughter, then do what I tell you. Elliot entered April's room. He had not imagined his meeting with her like this, but now the situation was such that there was no choice. He went to the bed and looked at his only child, who was actually dying. The father's heart clenched with pain, but now he had to pull himself together and try to do something to help her. Tell me, where does it hurt? Everywhere. He began to examine April, identifying the trouble spots from her reactions. How long have you been like this? Just like this for about two weeks. I see. Can you move your arms? I can a little. Do it now, please. April moved her arms. Can you lift them? I'll try. April lifted her arms up, but immediately dropped them helplessly to the bed. Your hands are numb, so you can't hold them up. Yes. What about your legs? Can you feel them at least a little? Was it like this right after the accident? Barbara tensed up, anticipating that April might question how he knew. Barbara decided to come to the aid of her brother. April, I'm sorry. I told him everything. It's okay, Barbara. It's not a big secret. April turned to her father and answered. I didn't feel it at first. Then, after several operations, I even tried to walk with a walker, and then they found a tumor in my lumbar region, and my legs stopped working every day. Now I practically can't control them any more. Elliot looked at Barbara in surprise, then at his daughter, and asked, "So you were able to walk after the operation? Did I get it right?" "Yes, that's right. With difficulty, slowly." But I could walk. May I see your back? Yes, of course. Barbara helped her to turn on her side, but Elliot asked her to lie on her stomach. He examined his daughter's back for about twenty minutes, pressing somewhere, checking sensitivity, examining the tumor on her lower back, and suddenly said, "I can help you. You'll walk if you trust me and have patience." Barbara almost fell over in surprise. April turned sharply to her side and said, "You see, you can do it yourself without Barbara's help. Listen to me cautiously. You need a good course of chiropractic massage, special exercises, some medication, and a wagon load of patience. And I promise you, you will walk." "I'm sorry. What's your name, Santa Claus?" April sneered with obvious disdain. The doctors told me there's no chance of walking again, and practically no chance of survival either. Why are you mocking me with false hope? I wasn't mocking you in any way. I stand by my words. You can read reviews about me on the website of the clinic where I work, and to avoid baseless claims, I'll do something now, and you'll see what happens. Do you trust me? Let's do it," April defiantly replied. Elliot leaned over and pressed something under April's knee. She felt a jerk in her leg and burst into laughter. "It tickles!" she exclaimed, realizing that she hadn't felt a tickle in a long time. "How did you do it?" "It doesn't matter. Do you believe me a little now?" The man smiled at her. "A little," April smiled back. She liked this man. There was a remarkable warmth emanating from him. Even through his hands, Barbara and Elliot left the room. Did you tell her the truth? Barbara asked. And do you think I could lie to my own daughter? I don't know. This is the first time I've seen you. I understand. I'm distrustful too. Elliot smiled. I will come tomorrow at nine o'clock. Please inform April. I need to buy some medication and supplies for the massage. Yes. Okay. We'll be waiting for you tomorrow. Barbara said. Looking at Elliot with gratitude, and thank you for giving her hope. It's critical. She's my daughter, and I'll do everything in my power to help her regain a normal life. 
was my duty. He left, and Barbara returned to April's room. Do you think he'll be able to help me, Barbara? Somehow I want to believe him. April, if you believe in him and support Elliot in every way you can, I believe you two can succeed. I'll try my best. But let's not tell Rick anything yet, okay? I don't want him to find out before the time is right. Sure, whatever you say. The next day, as promised, Elliot arrived at nine o'clock. After having coffee together, they started with a massage, followed by a small set of exercises. Despite April's eagerness for quick progress, Elliot strictly forbade her from doing anything on her own without his knowledge. April, remember, we need results, not speed. You're not ready for heavy loads, and it will take time to get there. You need to progress gradually and correctly, otherwise you might have the opposite effect. And we don't want that, do we? No, of course not, April agreed. Good. Can we also have sessions on weekends? Only on Saturdays. My husband is home on Sundays. It's his only day off, and I don't want to tell him about you just yet. Okay, here's the plan then. On Sundays, you'll have sessions supervised by Barbara. I'll provide her a lesson plan. I think you can keep your husband away from you for an hour. Yes, of course. He is usually exhausted on the weekends, so Sunday is when he catches up on his sleep for the week. Great. They continued with massage and exercises with Elliot six days a week, and Sundays were for supervised exercises with Barbara. There were no visible results yet, but it had only been two weeks. April could see the strength gradually returning to her arms and legs, and her mood was improving. However, she was frustrated with her relationship with Rick. He was staying at work later and later, and today he even stayed overnight. April cried for half the night. She understood that he had commitments, but she couldn't help feeling sorry for herself. It seemed that his promise to be there for her was becoming untenable. Maybe he's dating another woman. The thought crept into April's mind, which made her very upset. The next day, when Elliot arrived, April was completely without mood, and therefore without the motivation to study. The father immediately sensed her mood and quietly asked, Are you in pain? April sadly replied, My heart is aching. Taking her words literally, Elliot asked her anxiously, Where exactly does it hurt? Have you had heart problems before? No, that's not why it hurts. I think my husband has a mistress, although I understand him, of course, she unexpectedly admitted. What nonsense! What makes you think that? Elliot exclaimed. He didn't come home last night. This has never happened before. Trying to reassure her, her father said, April, that doesn't prove he's having an affair. He's probably just tired. You have to understand that it's hard not only for you, but also for him. Don't judge him, and don't get angry. I believe things will get better with time. Curiously, April asked Elliot, Do you have a wife? Elliot shook his head negatively, and April continued, And children? Yes, a daughter, Elliot answered, but I only recently found out about her. I'm tormented by the fear of admitting to her that I'm her father. Why? Did you leave her? No, I would never abandon my child. Her mother didn't tell me that she was pregnant when we broke up. I left town to forget her, and then years later, I found out that I had a grown daughter. Then you definitely should tell her. Do you know where she lives? Yes, but I'm afraid. April insisted. I think you should do it. I didn't know my father, don't even know who he was. But if he knocked on my door right now and said, April, hello, it's me, your daddy, I'd be jumping up and down. Elliot took a moment to gather his thoughts and then walked towards the door, saying, Wait a minute, please. With his heart pounding in his temples, Elliot walked out the door, thinking, It seems that my blood pressure is now 200 over 150, but I must act. This is such a chance. 
He knocked confidently on the door, opened it and entered the room. April, hi. I'm your daddy. April was stunned, looking at him. They stared at each other in silence and didn't dare to break the silence. Elliot was waiting for any reaction from his daughter, while April couldn't believe what she was hearing. Tears streamed down her face as she asked, Are you really my dad? Elliot approached the bed, sat down in a chair and retold the story of his life. When he finished, April simply said, You have no idea how glad I am that you were found. I wanted to find my mother, but then I changed my mind. But having such a wonderful father, I couldn't even dream of it. They continued talking for a long time, each sharing their life stories before this meeting. April proudly listened to her father's tales of success and accomplishments. Her father listened tearfully to the story of his daughter's life. They had so much to talk about, and no one interrupted them. After that day, April became even more obedient, diligently following her father's recommendations. Now she had no doubt that she would recover, because she was being treated by the best doctor, who was more interested in her recovery than all the other doctors combined. The sessions went on for a much longer time. Father and daughter couldn't get enough of each other. They even called each other in the evenings and had long conversations on the phone or through Skype. April was going to tell her husband, but she still never got the chance. Every day, by the time he came home, April was already asleep. Her classes had been exhausting, and she typically fell asleep around ten o'clock in the evening. Her father believed that this was a good thing, as he considered sleep to be the best medicine for her body. It had been like that for almost a month. That day, Rick arrived at the house around eleven o'clock. He was sure that everyone was asleep. But upon entering the house, Rick overheard April talking to someone. This is very strange. Why is she awake? And who could be visiting so late? wondered Rick. He moved closer to the door and listened. I am very grateful to you, April said to someone. I don't know how I would have coped without you. You came into my life at such a good time. Stop thanking me. I love you, and I'm doing everything possible to make you feel good, replied a male voice. They're talking on video, Rick guessed. What time will you come tomorrow? April asked. Tomorrow I need to buy something else for you. I'll be later. Maybe I'll arrive around ten or half past eleven. Now get some rest. It's late. Good night. I'm sending you a hug. I love you. Good night. April calmly responded. These words sent a shiver down Rick's spine. And I love you. See you tomorrow, replied the man's voice. Rick was furious. It turned out that his wife had met someone, most likely at the hospital, and was now having an affair behind his back. Maybe she was pretending to be sick so she wouldn't have to sleep with him, and even Barbara knew about it, while he was the only one who had been played for a fool. Rick walked over to the bar in the living room and poured himself some wine. He rarely drank, and when he did, it was only light drinks. His thoughts were jumbled in his head. He sincerely couldn't understand how his April could cheat on him, especially in her current condition. He poured himself a second glass, drank it in one gulp, and then went to the bedroom, where April was already sound asleep. Should I wake her up or not? Rick pondered, and looking at his wife more closely, he realised that something was amiss. What was it? Something about April's body position didn't seem right. And then it hit him. April's right hand was above her head on the pillow, but that couldn't be. She couldn't lift her arms. They were failing. So she had lied to him after all. Rick got furious and decided to catch them red-handed the next day. The next morning, as usual, Rick left for work at eight o'clock. He informed Barbara that he would be late today, and that she didn't need to cook for him. Barbara nodded in agreement and went to the kitchen. Rick glared angrily at the nurse. She's probably laughing at me, 
Rick mumbled, getting even angrier. April woke up at nine o'clock. She had a light breakfast with Barbara and waited for Elliot. Barbara was acting strangely today. Barbara, are you okay? April asked. Yes, everything is fine. Why do you ask? Barbara blushed slightly. I don't know. You seem different today. You've imagined it, Barbara initially replied. But then she sat down on a chair and suddenly confessed. April, you know, I like your father. Whenever I see him, I feel shy and nervous. But that's great. What's wrong with that? rejoiced April. What if he has someone else? I don't want to interfere in someone else's family. I'll find out. April winked and smiled. Thank you very much, but don't give me away. Barbara got nervous. Come on, how could you? It's women's solidarity. April smiled again. She was in a good mood. The result of the lessons with her father was visible. April could already stand on her feet and even take a few steps with the help of a walker. Yes, running is still far away and unlikely to be possible, but at least something. And her hands were almost no longer numb. Elliot walked into the living room, said hello to Barbara, hugged April, and took her into the room to massage. Barbara was making dinner and didn't even hear Rick come in. Barbara, is April in her room? She heard the owner's voice, and surprised, she dropped the plate on the floor. It shattered. Oh, we haven't waited for you so early, Barbara said, the first thing that came to mind. Can't I come home early? No, I was just surprised. Would you like some coffee? she asked. Are you kidding? You think I came home so you could make me coffee? Where is my wife? Is she in her room? Or did she run out on a date already? Oh, what are you talking about? What date? April's home. But you've got it all wrong, apparently. Barbara said to Rick's actual back. But the man heard nothing. Anger and even rage seized him. He had always been accustomed to protecting his own, including April, since childhood. He tore the doorknob and saw a sight that made him feel terrible. Rick grabbed his rival by the shoulder, forcefully pulled him towards himself, and struck him in the face with his fist. Elliot was clearly unprepared for this, and fell onto the bed from the blow. Rick wanted to pick him up and hit him again, but April shouted, "'Don't touch my father!' It was as if a bucket of cold water had been poured over Rick's head. Father? Where did he come from? Rick asked, bombarding April with questions. If you calm down, I'll explain everything to you now. It was only that Rick noticed that April herself was standing on the floor. Are you walking? Just a little bit. If you don't keep beating my father, I'll walk more. I don't understand anything, Rick barely whispered, realising he had acted foolishly. Dad, Barbara, have some coffee, please. I need to talk to my husband, April said. She leaned over to her father. Are you okay? I'm fine. Teeth seem to be in place, Elliot smiled. You didn't tell me your husband was so jealous. I'm sorry. I didn't think it could happen myself. Elliot and Barbara left the room. April sat down on the edge of the bed and gestured for her husband to sit down beside her. She recounted the story of meeting her father from the first time he appeared in the house, that he was a doctor, and that he was helping April recover. Why didn't you tell me about it right away? Rick wondered. I wanted to surprise you, first of all, and secondly, I wasn't sure what the outcome would be. I didn't want to give you false hope. What if I had hit him harder? Did you think about that? How was I supposed to know what you had in mind? How did you even find out? Last night when I came in, I overheard you confessing your love to someone. Rick lowered his head. And what was I supposed to think? And you immediately assumed I had a lover? In my condition? Are you serious? And you and I once agreed not to lie to each other, and not to hide anything. I am certainly wrong for hiding this news from you too, but I couldn't think you'd think I was cheating on you. It doesn't matter what I thought. The important thing is that I was wrong. 
I'm sorry, please forgive me. I'm an idiot, but I have an excuse. I'm an idiot in love. You will forgive me, won't you? Sure, only you have to apologize to Daddy, too. Of course, what's your father's name? Elliot. Okay, let's go apologize. Rick took his wife to the living room. Elliot and Barbara sat on the sofa and drank coffee. I'm sincerely apologizing for being so rushed in my conclusions, Rick said to Elliot. I didn't mean for our acquaintance to happen this way, but I didn't know anything about you and couldn't even imagine that you could be April's father. Come on, it's all right. It will heal before the wedding, smiled the father-in-law. Before the wedding? marveled April. Before my wedding, of course. I have never been married, by the way, Elliot smiled. How interesting, April smiled enigmatically. I hope you will invite us. Of course, if Rick promises not to fight, said the father and everyone laughed. Will you invite me? asked Barbara sadly and quietly. Of course I'll invite you. Don't worry. Elliot smiled and changed the subject of the conversation. April, we haven't finished with you today yet. Yes, Daddy, of course. Now I'll see Rick off and then I'll go back to the room. And you finish your coffee. In the evening, she arrived to the kitchen where it smelled very delicious. Barbara, what are you cooking that is so magical? I'm just drooling. Barbara was standing with her back to the hostess. Without turning around, answered, Your favourite meat is baked. April heard Barbara's voice trembling. Barbara, turn to me, please, she asked. I'm sorry, I can't. Don't make me drive all the way across the kitchen to you. Barbara turned around, and April saw that she was crying. Barbara, what's wrong? Don't you understand? Your father is getting married, and for a moment I thought he liked me too. Oh, I think your tears are premature. There is no need to get upset prematurely. When should I be upset? When he brings me an invitation? Barbara, everything will be fine. It seems to me that he was just joking about the wedding. April tried to reassure Barbara. It didn't seem that way to me. At that moment, the doorbell rang. Who could that be? Barbara wondered and went to open it. Elliot stood on the threshold with a huge bouquet of roses. Dear Barbara, in all the time I've known you, you've become really dear to me. I can't hide my feelings any more. That's why I ask you to become my wife. He handed her the flowers and a small box with a ring. Barbara took the box, and tears ran down her cheeks. The ring was very beautiful. Barbara took it out of the box and put it on her finger. Does that mean you agree? Elliot asked hesitantly. Sure. April answered with a happy smile. But I just have one favour to ask of you. Let's have the wedding when April can walk. It's only a couple of months away. Oh, it's no problem at all. Sure, we'll wait. Barbara immediately agreed. Five months later, April was already walking around the house on her own. Not quickly, but without a walker, only with a stick. Elliot moved into his daughter's house and now spent even more time with his future wife. One evening, the men sat in the gazebo and talked. At this time, Rick was worried about one question. How did it happen that the doctors gave up? But Elliot brought her back to life. You see, Rick, the doctors decided that April had a tumour on her spine, and it wasn't a tumour, but an invertebral hernia. It can be removed with chiropractic care or with surgery. It was a trivial medical error. It's just that April had such a complex musculoskeletal system that they came to this conclusion. It happens. What would we do without you? Rick said. If it weren't for you... Oh, stop thanking me. I did what I had to do. This is my daughter, to whom I am very indebted, even though it's not my fault. The important thing is that we didn't give up as a team. I thought it would take longer, but April did well. She recovered much faster. Rick, I have an offer for you. I realise we need to discuss it with our women, but I wanted to talk to you first. Intriguing? What's up? Rick was interested. I just wanted to offer to build a bigger house. I'll sell my apartment in the capital. 
It's more than enough to expand. April can't do without Barbara's help anyway. I'll be the backup. And there's not enough room for us in this house. I don't mind. Let's just ask the women. The men went back into the house. Barbara and April were sitting on the sofa in the living room discussing the wedding. Barbara didn't want anything grand, and April was urging her to give in. Barbara, I really want you to have a mega cool event. My dad got me on my feet. You're my indispensable person. Is there anything I can do for you in return? Barbara, Elliot intervened. I think it's better to give in. April still won't back down. Okay, Barbara agreed. And there's something else we wanted to talk to both of you about, Elliot began. Your dad has offered to build one big house for all of us. Each of us will have a room, a couple of guest bedrooms, a kitchen living room, and your office. What do you say? April playfully gave her husband and father a, a resentful look. Is something wrong? Rick tensed. It seemed to him that his wife didn't like the idea. Yes, April replied. When do you want to start building? Tomorrow, Rick immediately answered. If there are no objections. Okay, build. But in eight months you'll have to rebuild. April calmly said and winked at Barbara, who already knew everything. I don't get it. Why rebuild? Rick was genuinely surprised. Because among the listed rooms, there is no nursery, smiled April. Rick looked at his wife incomprehensibly, then at Elliot, and shrugged his shoulders. Do you understand anything, Elliot? I think I do. In eight months, I'll be a grandfather, and you'll be a father. Rick's father-in-law joyfully shouted. Tears came to Rick's eyes. April, is it really true? It's absolutely true. I was at the doctor's yesterday. April smiled. Rick ran up and hugged his wife. He was in a state of shock and couldn't believe what was happening. A year ago, it seemed to him that their happy family life was over, and there would never be anything good again. But with the arrival of his father-in-law in their house, everything changed abruptly. A week later, Elliot and Barbara got married. They had their wedding in a small circle. Rick and April presented the newlyweds with a trip as a wedding gift. Barbara, who had never travelled abroad, almost fell off her chair. Why? It's so expensive. I'm embarrassed. Really? Rest. You still have a grandson or granddaughter to take care of, laughed Rick. While the newlyweds were away, April and Rick worked on a project for their big new house, but didn't start construction without the approval of Elliot and Barbara. When they returned, the project was approved and construction began. The house was finished just in time for the birth of the child. April gave birth to a daughter. They named her Hope, because Hope had helped them survive everything that happened to them. <laughs>